Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to FMA Discussion. This is episode 311, and today we're starting a little earlier than normal. Uh, that is to accommodate uh, our guest who uh, lives in France. I'm really excited about this one. A big thanks to Tuan Michel. He really coordinated this, and he's going to be translating. Uh, this could not be done without him. So, uh, you know, a big thank you to him. And without further ado, I'm going to be bringing them both up. So basically what's going to happen is Tuan Michel is going to take the lead, and I'll click in with questions and all that. So he's basically going to be translating and everything. So I'm really, this is, I think it's going to be a great one. Um, boxing, grappling, weapons. Can't get any much better than that. And plus there's a box background and championships and uh, some legislation stuff versus civilians. All good stuff. So without further ado, here we go. Welcome. Thank you both for uh, coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dean. So, so as Dean stated, uh, I wanted to introduce everybody to one of my teachers, Robert Paturel, uh, known as Patu to his friends and actually almost everybody who trains with him in Europe. Uh, Robert has been my teacher for a while and uh, I mentioned him when you had me on your podcast. and. While he's a Sabat champ, he moved into combatives instruction for the police in France, where he was the member of an elite police group. We'll get into that, too. Uh, and while he was with the police, he was asked to set up a combatives program. And there was a lot of uh, material that came from FMA. And we'll be discussing that today, as well as a to his approach uh, against weapons, uh, against knives, against sticks. So it should be good like that. So to give everybody a, a quick introduction, Robert uh, is a former, well, I guess you're not really a former champion. If you're a champion once, you, you earn that title, you keep it. So he was six times champion of Europe uh, and then one time European champion. And that was the only time I think the Euro European championships had started. Now they have world because Sabat is, uh, is becoming bigger. But at the time, those were the main titles you could have. Uh, he has 103 fights, 88 wins, 11 losses, and four uh, draws, which is uh, pretty impressive if you think about how rough Sabat is. I don't know if people know Sabat very well, but it's quite rough. Uh, they target the knees and everything, not just the legs. It's a very tough, very fluid martial art. So uh, he's also been uh, the main Sabat instructor well, I shouldn't say that. He was brought in as a guest instructor at the Santo Academy in the 80s, three consecutive years. And uh, Robert will collect me, co correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think he was brought over by Salem Asli, who was a very famous Sabbat teacher under Danny Santo. So uh, without any further ado, uh, there's Robert, and uh, we'll start with uh, questions about Sabbat. Donc, Robert, est-ce que tu peux nous parler un peu de ton cheminement à Sabat? Quand tu as commencé tes instructeurs, tes influences? Ah, J'ai commencé, euh, en, en, toute ma famille faisait de la boxe, moi. Mes frères, euh, mes frères ont toujours fait de la boxe anglaise. Et euh, moi, j'étais intéressé par la boxe euh, aussi, mais assez tardivement, à 16 ans, j'ai commencé à... Je faisais déjà de la boxe avec mes frères, mais je ne la... faisais pas le rapport entre la boxe et, et la rue, quoi. Pour moi, la boxe, c'était un jeu et la rue, c'était différent. J'ai pris conscience de ça à, à 15-16 ans, euh, qu'il fallait apprendre à se défendre. Et, et je suis allé, euh, le club qui s'est qui était, euh, ouvert, un club de boxe française à Nanterre, qui était à 4 km de chez moi, 4-5 km de chez moi. Et donc, j'allais à pied euh, au club. Euh, tous les... Mon professeur s'appelait Richard Genodeau, qui était un descendant euh, direct des, des grands professeurs de... de de, du siècle dernier, quasiment. Et, euh, et puis, je me suis, ça m'a plu tout de suite. Quoi. Ça m'a plu tout de suite. J'ai fait mon premier combat euh, trois mois après. Et puis, euh, c'était parti euh, dans l'engrenage. C'est bon. Uh, so, interestingly enough, Robert says that everybody in his family, when he was younger, boxed. They did the traditional English boxing, all of them. And he wasn't all that interested until... And when he was 16, he said things got rough and uh, he figured he better learn how to defend himself. So he started training in Sabat. And uh, 
one of his, his professor, Richard Genot, is that it? Yes. Ça? Genodot. Genodot. Richard Genodot was his teacher, and he was one of the descendants of the greats, right? You see all the names from the great uh, Sabbath teachers. So Robert comes from, uh, I guess you could say, a royal line of instructors, of which he is uh, a great representative himself. And he said that he really took to it, he liked it, and he got his first fight three months after starting training. So that's pretty good. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. So um, what did he find like that he appreciated more than the pure box in Queensbury? Like what did he, what did he appreciate more with the Safat as far as compare and contrast to the uh, Queensbury boxing? Absolutely, good, good question. Alors, Robert, pourquoi tu as préféré la savate à la boxe anglaise? Parce qu'il n'y avait pas de boxe anglaise à côté de chez moi. La, le club de mes frères avait fermé. Il n'y avait plus de boxe anglaise. Et, euh, et donc, la, et, et la savate, ça m'a toujours attiré parce que dans mes lectures, moi, je lisais beaucoup quand j'étais jeune, je n'avais pas la télé. Et dans les, les écrits de Jules Verne, les écrits de euh, Victor Hugo, les écrits de... A, on, on parlait souvent de la savate, même dans Tintin, on parle de la savate. J'allais pour dire Tintin aussi, oui. Et, bah, tu sais pourquoi C'est parce que le, un grand professeur, Charlemont, pendant l'époque de la Commune à Paris, est par, a migré en Belgique. Et il a, et il a fait un gros, une grosse euh, incursion en, de savate en Belgique. C'est pour ça que Hergé a pratiqué la, la boxe française. Voilà. Oh, je le savais pas. That's super interesting. Okay, well, the, the, the basic answer is very pragmatic. He went to Savat because uh, the boxing club closed. Uh, but oh, that's at pretty the easy. time, he said he was always attracted. Mais, mais pour, pour répondre à Dean, j'ai fait de la boxe anglaise après. Oui, oui, oui absolutely. Après, oui. Oui, oui. So he said eventually he did get into English boxing because, trust me, his, his English boxing skill is uh, superb. So what happened, he said, when he was younger, he was still attracted to Savat very much because it, it, was a, it, it was a big part of French culture. A lot of writers like uh, Jules Verne, you know, around the world in 80 days and all that, he had Savat a lot in his books. Victor Hugo even had Savat, uh, Eugène Sue, and like a particular... Uh, Maurice Leblanc, he... Arsène Lupin... That's right. Arsène Lupin, who's recently made like a resurgence in France, was also a Sabbat practitioner. But uh, one that Robert and I appreciate particularly is Tintin, or as they say in English, Tintin. So he was also a Sabbat practitioner. And uh, the reason for that was that Hergé, the creator of Tintin, was actually a Sabbat student of Charlemont. Anybody who knows a little bit about Sabbat knows that Charlemont was one of the big names and he had moved to Belgium and that's where Hergé, the creator of Tintin, trained under him. So pretty cool. Oh, wow. Yeah. wow. So from there, I guess, you know, obviously his decorated career in that, um, Dan Asano obviously caught wind of it, brought him out there. And I'm going to guess that kind of perpetuator started his um, exposure to FMA. Yes, that's, that's actually how it went. Robert, pour euh, la manière que tu as été approché pour aller enseigner chez, chez Danny Santo, si je me souviens bien, c'était Salem Asli qui t'était amené? Oui, Salem, Salem Asli, il est venu euh, sur Paris. J'ai fait sa connaissance sur Paris. Et, euh, mais il enseignait, lui, déjà euh, aux États-Unis. Il était parti aux États-Unis euh, à la recherche de Bruce Lee, un peu euh, comme, comme tous les jeunes euh, de l'époque. Et euh, il a été pris par Dani Santo et Dani Santo lui a dit bah, « tu vas faire un cours de boxe française chez moi ». quoi. Mais euh, Dani Santo était aussi intéressé par l'aspect la, compétition, euh, parce que Salem ne faisait pas de la compétition. Euh, c'était euh, C'est un très très bon technicien, c'était un très bon chorégraphe, mais c'était pas un combattant en fait. Ok. Voilà, donc okay. Euh, il, il voulait voir des combattants. Euh, et la première année, quand on y est allé à Troyes, mais… Euh, il, il s'était un petit peu égaré dans, ses, dans son calendrier, ce qui fait qu'il avait un stage en Espagne, il n'a pas pu l'annuler. Donc, Dan n'était pas là. Okay. Quand il est revenu, il, il m'a envoyé un message en disant euh, « tous mes, tous mes instructeurs ont été ébahis par la boxe française, donc je, je, je vous fais revenir l'année prochaine. » Revenez à trois. Donc, je suis venu avec deux autres l'année suivante. Et l'année d'après, encore, euh, je suis venu, mais cette fois tout seul. Il m'a fait venir tout seul parce qu'il m'a dit, toi, tu ne fais pas que ça. Tu fais, tu fais d'autres choses avec. 
Alors, il, il, il avait compris que je m'intéressais beaucoup à toutes les disciplines et que j'étais un petit peu, euh, voilà, j'aimais bien aller voir ah, ce que faisaient les autres. OK. Donc, tu es allé initialement en 83, c'est ça? 83, 84, 80, euh, je ne sais plus si c'est 85 ou 86, la troisième OK, fois. ça va, ça va. OK, so, what's interesting is, uh, it was actually Salem Asli that, uh, that uh, reached out to or trained with, uh, with uh, Robert, and he was already the Sabbat instructor at the Innocento Academy, but mm. uh, Robert points out that while Salem was an excellent technician and a great teacher, He was not a fighter. He didn't have a lot of fights. So Inosanto asked him if he could bring in some experienced uh, fighters, and he immediately, immediately thought of Robert, and that's how he brought him in the first time in '83. And Robert went with actually two uh, other Sabbat champs. So the three of them gave a 10-day seminar that was like on mm -hmm. for every night. It was very well received, and he said that first time. Uh, They had a scheduling conflict, and uh, Guru Dan was actually in Spain. He had messed up his uh, his schedule, so he missed the seminar. And then after Robert returned to France the first time, he said that uh, Dan wrote him a note saying that all his instructors had been blown away by what they had seen. And he was inviting him to come back again the following year, where Dan made sure he would be at that time. So Robert came back with the same two uh, Sabbat champs, and so the three of them gave another seminar, which was also very well received. And um, after that, um, the following year, or maybe the year after, uh, Guru Dan invited uh, Robert to come by himself to teach and train. So hmm. that's that's where we're at now. Jeez. So, and then um, I don't. So I don't know what you. Uh, Tom, John, what you had as far as other questions. Did, did that, was uh, during that time, did he get any exposure, you know, to FMA? But I don't want to jump if you had some questions. No, no, no. That's that's where I was going. That's that's the right thing. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, alors, Robert, quand tu étais là, est-ce que c'est là que tu as eu ton premier aperçu des arts martiaux philippins? Euh, non, j'avais déjà, j'avais déjà vu des gens. Ben déjà, quand Salem était venu, j'avais déjà vu quelques bribes de ce qu'il faisait. Ça m'intéressait déjà tout de suite. Ça m'intéressait tout de suite. Et okay. puis euh, voilà. La, la, et la première année, euh, ben quand j'ai, j'ai découvert le Tonfa, surtout la première année. Oui, et, avec euh, la police de Los Angeles, c'est ça. Voilà. Okay. Au départ, on devait venir faire une démonstration, et finalement le le, 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 le précurseur du tonfa là-bas, euh, euh, je ne sais plus, il s'appelait Mar Marvis, euh, je ne me rappelle plus, non, comme ça. Il, a, il, il était un peu pas chaud, que vous, vous venez nous montrer quelque chose, c'est ça Vous venez nous montrer J'ai dit non, non, on ne vient rien montrer, on vient visiter l'académie. Puis là, je vois le tonfa, et quand je vois les gars travailler avec le tonfa, ça m'intéresse. Et là, il voit que ça m'intéresse. Donc, comme c'était lui le, le grand chef du tonfa, le, il a changé d'option. De, de, et puis, ce qui fait qu'à la fin, il nous a dit, bon, bah allez, faites-nous une démonstration de <rire> la savate. C'est le matériel. C'est bien. Yeah. Well, OK, so, uh, he said, actually, the first uh, time he saw it was through Salem, because when Salem went to see him in Paris, he showed him some of the FMA, which mm. he said really captured his attention, which he liked very much. Uh, the other thing that happened when Robert went to the Innocento Academy, He went to the LAPD Training Academy, and uh, when he was there, the, he said the head trainer approached him and uh, was kind of ticked off, you know, like, are you here to show me how to do my job? You think you're great? And Baba's like, no, no, nothing like that. And he's like, we're just here to learn and look around. And he said he saw uh, he saw a bunch of officers. This was early 80s, right, working with the Tonfa or the PR24. Mm. And he was impressed by that. So he asked if he could see some of that. And since the head trainer was the main expert, he was… Le niveau, very... le niveau était très bon parce qu'on avait, euh, avait 60 full instructeurs de chez Danino Santo. Qui dont... était là avec toi Oui, dont Danino Santo. On faisait trois, trois cours par jour. Le matin, le midi, l'après-midi. Danilo Santo, on faisait trois fois le même cours, en fait, parce qu'on prenait 20 personnes à chaque fois. Et Danilo Santo faisait les trois cours. Et en plus, il filmait et en plus, il prenait des notes. OK. So, getting, Donc, back, getting back to the training for a moment, uh, he was saying that uh, when they were teaching, they were teaching classes three times a day 
and they would only teach full instructors. So he was a trained trainer and it was actually 60 instructors that he was dealing with. Uh, and so everybody got a 10 day course of uh, three classes a day for three different groups of 20, except Guru Dan was doing the three classes every day. So there's no surprise there. Uh, Daniel Santo a été nommé moniteur de boxe française et gant d'argent de boxe française. Oh, wow. So uh, at the end of all this, Guru Dan managed to get uh, uh, his silver gloves and got recognized as a Sabbat instructor. So, yeah. And it was earned. It wasn't just like a gift. Yeah, no, no, no. no I'm sure of that. Wow. So, so he's, his first exposure, FMA, being um, in France uh, or Simon, um, did he, is it something that I, I know it, he was attracted to it? Is it when he went back, did he make an attempt to seek it out or like want more? That's a good question. So, alors, Robert, quand tu es retourné, uh, mais quand tu étais à l'Académie Innocento, est-ce que tu as essayé de découvrir un peu plus uh, à propos des arts martiaux philippins une fois que tu étais là? Bien sûr, que... bien sûr. Uh, et à chaque uh, quand il y avait une pause, je disais à. À Dan, montre-moi un peu le bâton. Et il disait non, je, je te donnerai mes livres, mais là je suis, je suis, je suis ton élève. Je suis, je suis pas, je suis pas ton professeur. Ça le gênait, okay. euh, voilà. Okay. Donc, pas so assez, we... pas okay. oui, ça, oui. Une chose qu'il faut, qui est importante, c'est que il était intéressé par la savate. Pourquoi Parce que Bruce Lee lui avait dit, euh, moi j'aurais peut-être pas le temps, mais si un jour toi tu as le temps, va voir la savate. Va voir la savate parce que c'est ça a l'air vachement bien. C'est ça qui a commencé, c'est ça qui a démarré au départ. Ok, ok, very interesting. So Robert says that uh, first of all to address your your question, did he seek out FMA? He said while he was there, he tried to learn everything he could, mm -hmm. and he said as soon as they had a break when they were teaching, he would approach Guru Dan and say, show me something with the stick, show me something, show me something. <laughs> we like I said, we touched on this yesterday. And Guru Dan didn't want to teach him because he was like, no, you're my teacher. It would be right. just very, very polite, right? The people who know Guru Dan can see this happening. So he said, what I'll do is I'll give you all my books. So he gave all the books he wrote to, to Robert and Robert started his studies from there. Wow. What, um, was there a particular weapon that stood out for me? Because I, I, I mean, I don't want to make a presumption here, but I'm assuming Savat, no weapon training. Am, am I correct in that? That's right. That's correct. Yeah. And he also added that the reason uh, they were interested in Savat over there is uh, Bruce Lee had told Dan to uh, seek out Savat. He's like, I'm too busy. I may not have the chance, but like, look to Savat. First chance you get, go look at Savat because it's very good. So that's where Dan's interest came from, from mm. actually Bruce Lee's recommendation. And uh, mais now I'll ask him about which weapon. Sure. Alors, il demandait quelle arme qui t'avait attiré le plus quand tu regardais à tout ça. Ah, bon, au départ, évidemment, j'ai fait du nunchaku comme tout le monde. <laughs> so, first, and first, like everybody else, nunchucks, right? So, the nunchucks. <laughs> Je me suis mis des coups sur la tête comme tout le monde. Mm -hmm. J'ai même assommé un peu mon chien qui, qui était derrière. Une fois. Yeah. Uh, and just quickly, he says, that, uh, like everybody else, he smashed himself in the head a few times and then he hit his dog. Oh, oh. And he hit his dog too, so I think that's when it stopped. Je me suis bien sûr intéressé au Cali parce que nous, on a la canne et c'est très proche de ce que. Ah, c'est vrai. So, just, just uh, uh, I forgot to mention, Savat does have weapons. It has la canne. So, oh, the cane. The walking stick, la canne, the cane which is influenced by uh, French fencing. So, yeah. How interesting. Okay. C'était surtout parce qu'à l'époque, en France, les, les, les gentlemen avaient une canne avec la, la bille. Ils avaient la canne qui allait avec. Et donc, ils apprenaient à se servir de la canne. C'est ça. So, back then, a gentleman would always have a walking stick. And it was part of the, of the culture of the time to, uh, to learn how to use it properly for self-defense. It's like Irish stick fighting, you know, the, yeah. they're walking into the bank, you know what I mean? You know, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But it's French, so not, not casting aspersions on the Irish, but French, very sophisticated can. And yeah. like, I found the Irish a little more rough. Listen, I'm allowed to say this because I got French and Irish blood, so I can't get in trouble. Oh, no, no, we allow that. Nobody can cancel me. Yeah, no, 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 no worries there. 
So, yeah. um, well, this is fascinating. Again, I don't want to uh, trump you because I don't want to over your question. No, no, but, no. Go, go ahead. Um, so what did he think of like the exposure of any to FMA knife? Like what, like what was his, um, his initial take on that? What, what if he was exposed to? C'est quand la première fois que tu as vu le couteau philippin? Puis c'était quoi ton impression de, de tout ça? Là, moi, j'ai vu le, 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 le... Tu peux parler du balisson? Euh, euh, N'importe quel couteau. Si c'est le balisson que tu as vu en premier, ça va aussi. Oh, c'est le balisson que j'ai vu en premier, okay. oui. Et notamment chez Prezias, il m'a montré euh, comment ils s'en servaient, eux. C'était euh, intéressant. <coughs> OK, so actually, his, his first exposure to Filipino knife was like serious exposure, I guess, uh, was through Remy Prezas, who uh, showed him how to use the ballast on. So it was oh, okay. quite impressive with that. Mais j'ai tra travaillé comme uh, videur en discothèque, donc uh, pendant trois ans, j'ai eu l'occasion de, de voir quelques, quelques couteaux. Quand même. Voilà. Ouais, et puis ça, c'était avant la formation formelle, c'était la réalité avant le théorique. Oui, c'était avant les, avant les stages. De, okay. De so, Robert says that he was a bouncer for three years, and that's where you learned the most about the knife over there. Yeah, uh, so, right? Yeah, his, his exposure was to reality before theory, so. Yeah, before he got actually, like, a uh, system or information. Yeah, wow, exactly. wow, wow, wow. Yeah. Um, hmm. So, I guess, you know, through the experience and then seeing, like, a, you know, a syllabus-oriented technical approach to it, drills, did he, um, did that complement his experience already? His existing Comme, experience? Alors, uh, Dean demande si que ce que tu as observé dans les arts martiaux philippins, ça avait des parallèles avec qu ce que tu avais vu avant. Euh, pour moi, c'est beaucoup plus proche du réel, quoi. OK. Dans, dans, un, dans un premier temps, c'est beaucoup plus proche du réel. Après, quand on commence à partir dans le... Par exemple, la première fois que je suis allé chez Prezias, je savais faire euh, le, le B à bas. Après, il m'a dit on boit un coup et on va, continue, on va faire l'arnis moderne. Et là, l'arnis moderne, c'est un peu comme les jeux d'échecs, tu sais, on est à trois coups d'avance. Euh, il pense que je vais faire ça, donc je vais faire ça, je vais faire ça. Je... Voilà. Là, j'étais un, un petit peu dépassé par les événements. Euh, voilà. et moi, j'aime bien l'arnis, le, vraiment le, la base, quoi. OK travailler la base. Okay. Après, après, pour moi, c'est très joli, mais... Euh, ouais, si on ne fait, de... fait pas dans la fioriture. Hein, le doute de l'efficacité. Plus on va dans la fioriture, euh, plus on descend au niveau de l'efficacité pour moi. Voilà. Complètement d'accord. Donc, so, so what Robert is saying, like, when he, when he had the opportunity to spend time with uh, Remy Prezas in the Philippines, he was very impressed by what he saw with the knife. Mm. And then, uh, you know, uh, he said, uh, Prezas, like, hey, let's have a drink and then we'll go train. So that's actually also very French. So uh, he, uh, yeah. he said that when they went outside and they started doing the, the, the modern Arnis with the stick yeah. fighting, he said, it's like a chess game where he's three steps ahead of you all the time. And he said he had a really hard time following at that point. But he also mentioned that he's a big believer in the in the basics, just the mm -hmm. very core basics. So he's been working with basics, and he said the more intricate it becomes, the less efficient it becomes. So he so likes true. My gosh, like the bigger, the farther it gets away from like what happens out there. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly it. Donc il est d'accord avec toi absolument là que. Quand, quand ça devient trop complexe, ça fonctionne plus. Oui, ça, ça peut, ça peut know, fonctionner. Right, a fighter. Ah, okay. That's why you pick that's why you pick up. À enseigner, ce n'est pas crédible, si tu veux. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. He, sorry, Dean, you were saying? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I thought he was, I'm sorry. But, yeah, the reason why he picked up on that, because he's a fighter. He, he saw yeah. that. Yeah. That's, that's it. You know? Il dit, c'est à cause de ton expérience en tant que combattant que tu peux voir immédiatement si ça va fonctionner yeah. ou pas. Voilà, puis, et puis euh, 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 tu vois, bah, quelquefois, j'ai imposé un peu, moi, Eric Solanier dans, pour Ed, pour le couteau, je disais aux gars, les, eh, faites du couteau avec lui, vous allez voir, c'est intéressant, il va vous apprendre des choses. Et les gars, ils disaient, mais euh, 
c'est pas, ce qu'il nous a montré, c'est pas crédible, quoi. Voilà. Okay, okay. Donc, euh, il préférait revenir à la base avec moi et puis faire des choses et des mises en situation réelles, quoi. Voilà. Okay. <coughs> He said they train when he was the head instructor at the raid. Uh, he had another, uh, he had another instructor that when he went away, he would ask the instructor. But the instructor was very much uh, a little more complex in his approach than Robert. So most of the guys there would go, "No, I want to train with you because it's easier. Just want the direct one-two bang. That's yeah, it." Yeah. Eric Solani is a very, very great technician. C est, c est... Bon, il a, il a commencé avec moi. C'est moi qui lui ai dit, va voir Danilo Santo, va voir euh, euh, tous ces gens-là. C'est moi qui ai montré le chemin. Et comme j'ai fait avec tous mes élèves. Avec tous mes élèves, j'ai fait ça. J'ai dit, va, va voir celui-là, va voir celui-là. C'est le chemin que j'ai fait. Ça. Donc, Eric, il est, il est très fort. Il, a fait, il est resté euh, des années aux Philippines après en, comme, comme instructeur. Donc, il est très, très fort. Mais quelquefois, il, 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 il oublie de, de montrer le, le début. Quoi, voilà. OK. So he's saying that uh, for people who do uh, PTTA, Eric Lolagne, who's also been my teacher, uh, Eric uh, mastered Filipino martial arts at a very, very high level. And uh, Robert says an ex exceptional technician and all this, but that Robert's approach is more uh, the core essentials, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, no, il faut aller voir Eric quand on a fait déjà deux ans ou trois ans de, de Cali. Quoi. Voilà. So, Robert says that, you know, if you've done, if you want to go anywhere in Cali, Eric is the person to go, to go and study with in Paris, in France, actually. I'm sorry, who's this? I'm sorry. Eric Lolagne is actually an excellent PTTA instructor, PTD instructor. Oh, and really? also okay. formerly, uh, formerly a Dani Nassanto instructor. But the thing is with Eric, he started under Robert. And Robert is the one who encouraged them to seek out Danny Nassanto in these, in these groups. And that's one thing about uh, Robert. He, he encourages all his students to go look around, train, test it out, seek new teachers and everything. Awesome. Not everybody does that. So no. I think that's why Robert has so many students, because he's so open and he encourages everybody to seek all kinds of uh, other disciplines, bring it back, they test it, they work together. So yeah, he's a very open-minded teacher and uh, there's no politics there. And as I mentioned quickly yesterday, Robert has so many students uh, that I'm aware of that are all masters and grandmasters in their own right. Uh, and in France, like the martial arts culture is very big. Uh, it's, a, it's very popular, all the arts are very popular over there. And almost all of the great teachers of the major disciplines look to Robert for a realistic approach to martial arts or fighting. So a lot of, you'll see like an Aikido grandmaster that's also ranked in, in books de rue under Robert because everybody likes to cross train over there and they're very, very good at martial arts. That's um, awesome. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, for a, a magnitude of reasons here, one, what he advocates to his students and that freedom to go find your way to complement what you're doing i mean instead of that indentured servitude where you know you know don't exactly it's not not cultish at all yeah, uh j'étais juste en train de, de parler du fait que toi tu as toujours encouragé tes étudiants à aller à l'extérieur oui. ce que je disais c'est pour ça que je pense que tu en as autant d'un très haut niveau uh, qui, qui s'entraînent avec toi parce qu'il y a une ouverture là, il y a un échange. Et surtout qu'ils sont tous restés mes amis. <laughs> and yeah, and he says the most important thing about all the people he trains with, they end up becoming friends and staying friends. Uh, yeah, that's what happens when yeah. you don't impose anything, right? So. No, they're probably, it, it, obviously it's, you know, they really like what he, you know, what he's advocating and all that. And it's obviously resonating with the community and, you know what I mean? So, you know, a salute to him for doing that. Um, that's just, it's I, I just love it. Like yeah, it's, uh, I agree, it's not common. Uh, yeah. A lot of people, it's, it borders on the cultish, right? So, oh, my cultish, or they like, you know, oh no, don't go over there. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, stay here. And, you know, I tell my students all the time, I mean, like, I don't have all the answers, man. <laughs> like, it, that's on, it. Like, <laughs> and you, you know, my teacher, Philippe Gelina in Montreal, is very much the same, very open minded. And yeah. I was very happy that uh, when, uh, well, this gives you an example getting back to Philippe Gelina, who's 
who's one of the top Piketty Tercia grandmasters in the world. He's a ninth degree Kajukembo. And I, I forget all these other certifications because Phil is not a normal pe person. It's insane. But you know who was there to train as a student when Robert came was Phil. Phil is like that. He still attends seminars and everything. Yeah. Very well, the two of them have uh, have a lot in common. J'étais en train de lui expliquer que Philippe j'ai une approche très similaire à la tienne avec une ouverture et toutes ces choses là. Puis que euh, quand il était venu enseigner, il est venu en tant qu'élève. Puis euh, il a pas essayé de s'imposer, il a pas joué de jeu. Je sais, j'ai j'ai admiré. Euh, c'est les gens, euh, c'est les plus grands qui sont les plus simples. Hein? Yeah. Et, uh, et, about, oui. Et oh, celui qui croit être son propre maître est l'élève d'un imbécile. That's yeah. right. And uh, <laughs> he, he was saying, like in reference to Phil, it's always the greatest that are the most humble, right? Very little ego. And I, I and I'd say the same about Robert. And he's got it, an expression in French. I'm going to try to translate it. Um, anyone who thinks is he is his own master is the student of an idiot. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Is it? Yeah, it definitely does. But you know, going back to that whole thing, I think what it is is I think that that guys that really train hard or or experience failures, like empty hand gets knife, for example, like you, it it, it humbles you, like because you know how prone you can be to getting injured, to getting maimed. You know what I mean? And there's a humility that just comes with that, and um, I think it's for the guys who throw themselves in there and man. I agree. And it's, it's respect for the knowledge, but it's also respect for what the person went through to get that knowledge. Right. Mm, because yeah. there's a lot of people out there who don't appreciate any of this. No. And, and yeah, I know, but we got some folks here. Oh, we got Eric PTK from France. Yeah. Uh, that's Eric somebody... Lolanier. Salut Eric. Yeah. He's somebody we got to get. <laughs> yeah. If he's interested, we got, Oh, we got men. Min from Canada. Yeah, That's Min was also an instructor in Box de Rue under Robert, uh, along as with everybody, everything. Oh, else. Min is? Oh, no. Yeah, Min. Oh, wow. sure. oh I didn't know that. Min. Perry Min. Kelly is over there too. Yeah, he's Perry's yeah. a great guy. And yeah. Perry trained with uh, Robert when he was here too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Perry's definitely very open minded. Yeah. Yes, I mean, wow, wow, wow. Yeah, yeah. So, and. Uh, Getting back to weapons, Robert, est-ce que tu veux expliquer un peu plus à propos du temps de fer, quand tu l'as découvert et comment tu l'as ramené? Eh bien, euh, on visite l'académie et je vois des, des, jeunes, euh, des, des jeunes étudiants, euh, enfin étudiants en police, quoi, qui pratiquent le, le temps de fer, quoi. Et, euh, et donc, ils voient que le, le, le responsable voit que ça m'intéresse. Alors, il me dit, bah, <coughs> Je vous propose, je vais vous faire une, on vous fait une petite vidéo. Alors au début, moi, je filme avec ma, ma caméra Super 8 qui, au bout de deux minutes, elle tourne dans le vide parce qu'il n'y a plus de film. Et euh, il a dû se rendre compte parce que l'année suivante, quand je suis revenu, il a, il a mis une caméra sur pied et il m'a fait une, une cassette euh, complète. Oh, wow. voilà. C'est impressionnant. Et euh, euh, juste, pardon, je vais juste de, de commencer la traduction. So. Uh, when Robert was at the Innocento Academy, he had a chance, like I said earlier, to go visit the LAPD and he was looking at cadets training mm -hmm. and he saw them using the, the Tonfa PR24 and he was very interested in that. So the head trainer there was very happy to show him how it worked. And Robert said back in those days, he would carry a camera, but it was like a Super 8. And he okay. said after like 10 minutes, he ran out of, uh, of film. Uh -huh. So the following year when he went, the teacher was there and waiting for him and he accommodated, he accommodated him, showed him everything and he filmed himself everything and he gave all that to Robert after. And oh, then wow. Robert went to introduce the PR24, but they, they, the police there still called it the Tonfa, but he introduced the Tonfa to French police. Oh, wow. Robert, right? yep. Et après, par rapport à la, à la France, quoi, la, la, au niveau de la législation, plein, plein de choses. Et puis, je trouvais que c'était euh, un travail un peu trop statique. Donc, j'ai fait beaucoup de déplacements. Les déplacements que j'ai empruntés à nos amis de l'Aïkido, par exemple. J'ai beaucoup travaillé les déplacements de l'Aïkido. Oh, wow. Et puis, euh, je me suis inspiré de, de plein de disciplines, en fait. J'ai pris, pris un peu partout. Euh, euh, la boxe, parce qu'on peut boxer avec un tourfa euh, aussi. Mm -hmm. Mais surtout, l'aspect la, protection, je, je trouvais que pour la police, ça me paraissait important. Quoi. Ah, bien euh, d'accord. So what Robert says is like, 
to him, the what he had seen by from LAPD was a very static use of the tonfa, and he said he added a lot of movement from Aikido of all arts uh, to his uh, tonfa practice, and then borrowed from boxing, and then he tested it out on, on uh, his fellow uh, martial artists and uh, police officers to come up with his own discipline, his own version uh, of what he. I think what it was with a lot, I, and I just have heard this before previous episodes when it covers, I, I think the, and I'm just, I'm speaking in terms of just the police forces in the U.S. Um, I think there's a budget issue, and I think they don't really don't go outside and really, some do now, they take it upon themselves, their own journey to better it and be well, you know, more protected. But I, but the time frame that you're referencing, I could definitely see how it was kind of limited you, you know what i mean like if you yeah. went there now it probably evolved i'm guessing yeah probably well evolved i'm not sure i think they may have uh, may have even discontinued its use or, it, or they still use it yeah. but uh so the other thing that robert added in his methodology he made sure it respected french legislation we were talking about that earlier so when robert trains and teaches all his uh methods have to be have to conform to french law except when your life is in danger then it's like let's go all out better to be uh tried by 12 than carried by six yeah right the <laughs> yeah. donc uh, je lui parlais de de, de ta méthodologie puis comment tu l'avais adapté et que tu t'assurais toujours quand tu enseignais de respecter la législation française en place bien sûr bien sûr alors euh, et, À part ça, pour le, le tonfa, après ça, ça a été implémenté. Ben, après, euh, après j'étais euh, tous les gars qui étaient avec moi euh, un petit peu en boxe. Et il y en a plein qui sont intéressés au tonfa. Et puis, les, les précurseurs, ça a été... Ben, tout, les, dans les premiers qui sont venus pratiquer, bien sûr, il y avait Eric Lallanier, il y avait Pascal Gilles, il y avait euh, il y a tout, euh, euh, comment, euh, Thierry Delief, enfin, tous les... les tous des noms, après, qui, sont, euh, qui ont explosé. Qui ont, il y en a plein qui ont gagné leur vie avec ça, d'ailleurs. OK. Euh, so Robert uh, explains that once once the thing once it was in place, he tested it with with a variety of people, of which he mentioned again Eric Lolagne and others. Uh, and he said some of them even went on to earn a living exclusively from teaching the tonfa after this. Yeah. Oh wow! So for good folks, oh that's oh, awesome! Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. So um, I don't know what you had as far as to go from here to on, but one thing I would like to know. Um, you know, I know he had some time with Remy when he went to the Philippines. I know his initial exposure kind of through the lens of an Asano blend and, and that. Did he um, pursue like, you know, where other FMA systems or did he pursue it deeply or did he just kind of take a little from there and there and then incorporate it, which is now what he's doing? OK, well, just to give you a little bit of context. Robert developed his own methodology for pretty much everything when he was the head uh, trainer for, for uh, the raid, while he was also uh, an assaulter himself. And he conceptualized what he calls the box de rue or street boxing. So, and he's got two books that are basically the curriculum for his method. The first one is all empty hands. And the second one is all dealing with weapons. So when he was exploring that, he went through every art but he said his major influence was Dan Inosanto at the yeah. time. Mm -hmm. But he went to a ton of different practitioners and they all worked it out, tested it all out, uh, both with the martial arts experts and with the police experts. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing the police experts could say was, well, this is not going to work under an adrenaline dump. Uh, it's too intricate. So that's how about develop this methodology and like i said he, he wrote two great books i'll put a link up after this oh great okay. his books are the curriculum for his method which i teach in canada along with min and sebastian and pascal uh so everything in there has been pressure tested and it works and uh that's what that's how he developed it but now i'll ask him who he went to and how he proceeded Donc, Robert, il, il veut savoir ton approche, comment tu as développé ton approche par rapport aux armes blanches euh, pour s'en servir, pour les contrer à main nue et tout ça. Le processus, je lui parlais du processus que tu as pris pour développer la boxe de rue, mais si tu peux donner plus de détails, puis les gens 
avec qui tu as travaillé des choses comme ça C'est une inspiration. En fait, j'ai fait, euh, à une époque, j'ai fait tous les stages. Dès que je voyais un stage photo, j'allais le faire. Euh, je t'avoue que quelquefois, je me suis quand même ennuyé dans certains stages parce que c'était euh, en dehors de... C'est oui. Robert says that when he was developing uh, this methodology, the first thing he did was attend every single seminar that was knife related. And he said he learned some there, mm -hmm. identify some people there, but also some of it was just ridiculous and boring, but he was going everywhere because he wanted to. Yeah, c'est des gens qui ne connaissaient pas un petit peu la rue, quoi. Voilà. Ouais, c'est ça. Donc, so, he said the least realistic teachers were the ones who had no experience of the street. Or, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm not surprised. It was handed to them, and they're just handing what was handed to them, even though their intentions might be good. But we do got a, um, Tuan, we got a question here from Perry, no less. Did Master Robert cross paths with the head of LAPD SWAT teams, Officer McCarthy, father of Big John McCarthy? Wow. When he visited the LAPD Academy. Uh, notre ami Perry Kelly demande si. J'ai vu la question. J'ai vu la question. Tu l'as la rencontré, non? Je ne crois pas l'avoir rencontré. Non. J'ai rencontré un, un SWAT à, le, à Los Angeles parce qu'à Los Angeles, il y, en a, il, y en a, il y en a une vingtaine de SWAT, je crois. Euh, dans la ville. Oui. Euh, je ne me souviens plus, j'ai des photos avec des gars, j'ai fait un entraînement avec eux, mais je ne me souviens plus lequel c'était à, à SWAT à, à Los Angeles parce que. Ça fait, ça fait quelques années. À, je crois que c'est à Santa Monica. Mais, ça. OK. So, uh, yeah, he says he never met uh, Big John's dad, or oui. as far as he knows, because he, he trained with some people over there, he's got pictures, yeah. but. It's been a while and it's hard to remember names. I yeah, guess. yeah, yeah, for sure. I, that's just a little trivia there. Big John's father was a... <laughs> I didn't know, but but uh, yeah, I don't know where you, you want to go from here. I, um, I, I'd be interested in just hearing his, um, you know, what was the inspiration for him to create the whole Ray thing and, and, and all that. But if you've got something before that, I mean, please. Yeah, well, I was just going to ask him what he thinks of the knife and how the teaching should oh, be. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's go, let's go with that for sure. Yeah. Ça fait donc basé sur ton expérience professionnelle et martiale. Comment oui. tu approches l'enseignement du couteau? Déjà, déjà, je dis aux gens, il a un couteau, vous n'en avez pas, vous partez. Okay. Partez. Voilà. Run away is the first one. So all the good instructors will tell you that. Et vous pouvez pas partir. Regardez ce qu'il y a autour de vous. S'il y a quelque chose qui peut vous servir, au moins à vous protéger. Okay. So and if if you can't run away, second yep. step is to identify something that could you, you could use as an improvised weapon. Equalizer. So yeah. Ce que je fais à la, à la fin, à la fin généralement de mon stage, je fais un exercice de le gars qui a un couteau qui va planter tout le monde dans, dans la rue, oui. je leur explique que si on se sauve tous, il va rester derrière les femmes, les enfants, les vieux, les handicapés. On ne peut pas se sauver tous. Donc, à partir du moment où, on, on, au départ, on sauve sa vie, puis quand on voit que derrière, on va laisser des gens, on ne peut pas se permettre de laisser des gens comme ça. Donc, il faut qu'il y en ait un qui prenne la décision. De, de, il demande aux autres, venez avec moi, les gars, on va, on va l'attraper. Donc, c'est oui. l'exercice que je fais à la fin souvent. Ah, mais c'est bien. So uh, it, this is this reflects uh, Robert's character very much, but he says that you should run away. But if you're going to run away and you're going to be leaving children, women, old people, or handicapped people at the mercy of a crazed knifer, yeah. you should engage. But before doing so, you should try to rally as many people as you can to take them down. And this is the kind of stuff he teaches at his seminars. Robert has got a very interesting approach to teaching mm. and there's a lot of scenario based uh, exercises and stuff and that's what he does uh, he'll he'll put like uh, someone with a knife in a group just walking around trying to stab people see if you're going to react or not and how to get a group together to take down somebody with a knife without getting cut so a group approach mm. so it's uh, it, his his ideas are, are very uh, avant-garde I find in the training I know I love that like um you know like the article I sent you the three e's so I mean like exit if you can 
egress ethical obligation. You got loved ones who can't run. You know what I mean? That's it. So, um, I'm I'm with them, as you know, and you. So on that whole subject matter, we're all on the same page. Yeah. yeah. Um, and- wow, that's great stuff. And plus, the way he um, tries to go, you know, with the group there, like you were saying, to get collectively, maybe you know, folks to kind of jump on. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's um, it. You know, like, but that's it. When you play with this drill, like, obviously, if you go out on the street, uh, probably not a big crowd's going to want to help you. But in these types, if you're teaching a team, uh, but for those drill, what ends up happening, some go in front, some go in the back, the side, you try to distract, take the legs, whatever. So, and when you play with that drill, you can actually become quite efficient at taking somebody down without getting hurt if you're obviously a group that's trained together. Yeah, yeah. For police that's... units, SWAT units, it would be a really great drill. It's music to my ears. I, I, yeah. you know, I commend them for, for doing that. Um, mm-hmm. So, so we're down, I don't want to accept, like if you had another question no, in no, regards really. to him. Um, I guess, again, what was the inspiration or the year when he kind of came up with this his organization or this this methodology. Robert, à quel moment tu as décidé de, de structurer une approche Qu'est-ce qui t'a motivé à faire ça ben, Moi, c'est, j'ai commencé. Euh, je faisais quand j'étais en boxe française. Déjà, je m'intéressais à la self défense. <rire> je me suis intéressé tout de suite à la self défense. Et donc, quand il y a eu la, la, la savate défense qui s'est créée, je me suis inclus un, un dedans un petit peu avec Eric Kéké. Oui. <coughs> Et puis, euh, comme la, la fédération, c'était, euh, c'était toujours un peu, un peu le bazar, bon, j'ai préféré euh, créer ma, mon, mon, mon propre t- truc parce que euh, moi, je ne ressentais pas les mêmes choses. Je, je, mon approche n'était pas exactement celle de, de la fédération. Okay. Donc, j'ai préféré euh, sortir du, du truc et faire mon truc de mon côté. Quoi. Okay. Et finalement, euh, avec Eric, euh, on s'est entendu après. Donc, Eric a quitté aussi la fédération et puis on, on est parti sur le même chemin tous les deux. Quoi. Voilà. OK. C'est voilà. bien. So, what Robert is saying that uh, he was always fascinated by self-defense and that's what, that was his main reason to go, going, for going to Savat anyways. But he said that Savat Defense came up, uh, which was a concept for self-defense within the Savat Federation. Uh, in France, Martial arts are highly regulated. You have to have federations, recognition, oh, I didn't know that. Okay. special training. Like every martial arts instructor you'll meet from France is highly qualified and trained in teaching methodologies, psychology of teaching, everything. It's very, very good. But Robert said that the, the Savat Federation approach to self-defense didn't really work for him. and he would know, right? So he decided to step outside the confines of uh, the Federation and structure his own approach because why try to fight, you know, just create your own thing. And that's what he ended up doing along with a colleague named Eric Keke. And that's how the Box de Rue came into being. That's fantastic, though, that he, you know what I mean? Like he, he didn't like it, so he wanted to present something that was better and take a risk and all that. So, I mean, kudos to him for not following the norm. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Il dit que c'est très bien de sortir de la structure si c'est trop confinant. Donc, oui, oui. Et puis, alors, la fédération de boxe française a toujours été un petit peu euh, euh, fébrile pour plein tout ce qui est euh, Nouveau. C'est, trop, c'est très traditionnel, c'est ça? Oui, c'est un peu trop traditionnel. OK, so he says that uh, the, the Savat Federation in France is very traditional and not very open to experimentation, right? They want to perpetually, they want to keep it pure, I guess, and uh, it's hard to evolve from that. Yeah, so, you're not going to evolve from, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I mean, I respect for the pure. Pardon? Dès, dès qu'il y a de l'argent, ça leur fait peur. Et ils n'ont jamais donné d'argent. Ils commencent à payer maintenant les, les, les boxeurs au championnat de France, mais moi j'ai fait 103 combats sans, sans gagner. La seule fois où j'ai gagné, c'est quand j'ai boxé Fred Royer, si tu gagnais un, un peu de sous, mais autrement, je n'ai jamais gagné d'argent. Tu avais un sandwich et un Coca-Cola, tu vois. Robert was saying that uh, Sabat, French Sabat Federation was always very tight with their money too. And he said, in his 103 fights, he never got paid once, even though he was a professional. He said it was usually a sandwich and a Coke. 
<laughs> wow. So Except one flag, one flag where he got paid. That's it. When he got when he got paid. That's that's a yeah. travesty. But at the same time, that's a true warrior. He's doing it just yeah. He's doing it absolutely for the passion. For glory, that's it. Yeah, for Alors, glory. <laughs> qui fait que les petits champions de chez nous sont partis en kickboxing uh, pour gagner des sous, quoi. Voilà. It actually hurt uh, Savat, he says, because a lot of people just transition to straight up kickboxing. To kickboxing. So when they're getting paid, yeah. yeah. <laughs> J'ai eu des champions du monde et une championne du monde en, en kickboxing. Yeah. Par contre, j'ai jamais, jamais pris de sous, moi, sur mes boxeurs. Je me refusais de... That's it. So he says that he's trained a lot of people, and trust me, he has. And he said he even had two world champions uh, for kickboxing. Mm. And uh, he said he never took a penny from any of his fighters, which is why they're all still good friends, because when you start talking money, that's how. Yeah, you good. leave that right. If, you, if that's out of the equation, you know. Um, so I don't know where you want to go from this, but I was going to ask him, unless, you know, of course, you had something else. No, 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 go ahead, Dean. Um, the two, you know, his approach, you know, as far as knife within his raid methodology, like two on one, you know, as everybody knows, I can't stand the two on one. So why do people do it? <laughs> so, alors, Robert, pour ton approche du couteau spécifiquement dans le cadre du raid, qu'est-ce que tu enseignes? Et basé sur quelle notion euh, en général? Alors, déjà, on travaille beaucoup nous, sur le. Quand tu, tu as ton arme à la main, par exemple, et que le gars, il a un couteau euh, et qu'il t'attaque avec le couteau. À partir du moment où il t'attaque, c'est trop tard. Pour, euh, même si tu tires, il ne va pas forcément le tuer et tu ne vas pas forcément l'empêcher de te planter. Donc, on travaille, on travaille les parades avec, euh, avec l'arme le, le, à la main. Et on, fait la même chose que, on fait la même chose que Manu, mais avec l'arme à la main. Et on écarte là, mais on se, met, on se met en retrait. Et là, à partir de là, on peut tirer éventuellement. Ah, oh, mais ça, c'est intéressant. OK, so this is an interesting approach that he came with. He says, usually, if you're being rushed by a mad knife uh, attacker, it's not the time to try to set your sights and everything. So he says, or try to go for your knife or whatever. So the first thing he does when someone attacks you with a knife and your, your weapon is already in your hands, he uses the weapon and the two hands to deflect the knife attack to be able to reposition and shoot. Quand j'ai ramené la règle des 7 mètres de chez oui. Daniel Franco, les, les moniteurs, les grands moniteurs de stand de tir de la police française se foutaient un peu de moi parce qu'ils disaient, attends, pas tu, on t'aime bien, mais là, 7 mètres, nous... Alors, j'ai dit, bah, je viens vous voir lundi. Je t'avais raconté l'histoire, je crois. Je ne me rappelle pas, mais si tu continues. Ouais. Alors, je leur ai dit, je viens vous voir lundi. Et le lundi, ils mettent, je leur ai dit, me mettez de la simunition euh, dans les armes. Et je dis, à quelle distance euh, vous pensez que vous pouvez me toucher avant que je vous plante Le premier, il dit deux mètres. Deux mètres, il n'a pas eu le temps de bouger, il était mort. Voilà. Alors, il a fait, il a fait oui, mais je n'étais pas prêt. Alors, il a fait le tour pour se remettre avec eux. Et les autres, à trois mètres, quatre mètres, cinq mètres. Et les, les seuls qui ont réussi à me tirer dessus, c'était au moment où j'étais sur eux déjà. Ok. Donc pour moi ils sont. C'est sûr. Fallait qu'ils qu décalent quoi. Fallait qu'ils qu partent en, en, à 45 degrés. Okay. Il a fallu que je leur fasse comprendre ça. Et euh, ça a mis presque deux ans pour qu'ils le mettent sur le papier quand même. Oh excellent. Ah voilà. oh, bon mais ça c'est très intéressant. Ok. So Dean uh, Robert talks about the 20 foot rule, 21 foot rule. Except since it's France right now, he's talking about the seven meter rules. So uh, he said that when he went to LAPD, he was telling them about the 21 foot rule at the time and how you shouldn't try to engage if, you know, as we all know, 21 foot rule, do you have a chance to take your weapon out mm -hmm. and shoot the guy before he gets to you? And that's what he was telling them. And they, they didn't believe him. They were kind of laughing at him. And these were all the, the firearms instructor. So he said he went to one of them and he said, how close do you think you could hit me before I get to you? And the guy said two meters, which is about six feet. So when they said go, well, Robert stabbed him and uh, he had uh, managed yeah, to keep his gun out. And there was a lot of, I wasn't ready. Yeah, I know. <laughs> 
So uh, th there was a lot of people that, you know, then they all tried, tried, tried. And he said, even at 21 foot, 20, at the 21 foot distance, he still managed to stab them, right? He said, even if they shot me, I got my knife in their neck. So yeah. he's a big believer in the 21 foot rule. Yeah, that's been, you know, what reduce, and I'm not saying you guys haven't seen this or all that, but guys, if they're, while they're drawing, they're falling to their back and then indexing. Um, I guess guys have had some success with that, reducing the 21 feet. Yeah. Well, I'm not is, a gun guy, so. Yeah, and neither am I, so let's ask the gun guy. Yeah. Uh, Dean que il a entendu parler, je sais pas si t'as déjà vu, quand t'es attaqué, de te projeter sur le dos et de tirer. Qu'est-ce que tu penses de cette approche-là? Alors, il y en a qui m'ont fait ça aussi, mais euh, je tombais dessus avec le couteau. Voilà. OK, so he said some, some guys did do that to him, but then he would just fall over them with the knife, right? He would so, just jump over their legs. And just... no, no, he, no, he would like literally drop him because he shot, he would just fall into them with his knife. Regardez à l'esprit, oh, yeah. il, il y a des gens qui sont touchés de trois balles mortellement, mais qui meurent cinq minutes après. Yeah. Et yeah, avec l'adrénaline, ils arrivent encore à, à venir euh, tuer quelqu'un. C'est ça. C'est pour ça que le, le fait de décaler, de tirer, tu tires, tu tires, tu tires en, en reculant. Et, euh, mais déjà, tu pars en courant. Il euh, ne faut pas, même pas penser quand il y a l'alarme à l'étui. Quand tu vois qu'un gars te fonce dessus, ce n'est pas normal. Ouais. Déjà, il faut décaler. Okay. En décalant, tu sors ton arme. Et éventuellement, plus loin, tu fais, tu fais la face, tu te mets en face. Et tu peux tirer, mais tu tires en okay. recul. Et tu penses d'abord à te mettre à l'abri. Si tu okay. restes là, tu es mort. Quoi. Tu peux être mort. Okay. So, what Robert says is, and, and some people have been shot with three mortal wounds and they'll still go for another five minutes. The adrenaline will keep them going. And so that's it. Even if you manage to hit them three times within that, that time and space range, you're still in mortal danger. So he says, And when we talk about the 21 foot rule, just to, to be clear, it's not when somebody's immobile like this and you just shoot them. That's when they rush you, right? And he said, if you're being rushed within that rule, within that distance, and your gun is not out, the first thing you got to do is run and you look for concealment and cover, and then you shoot. Yeah. But the first thing is just to get the hell out of there. And he said, once you start shooting, you should be backing up to right? You're increasing the distance as you shoot yeah. because uh, it's very dangerous. He said, somebody rushes you. First of all, as a cop, it's not normal that somebody rushes you. Chances are they have a weapon because as you know, you don't always see the knife, right? Mm. So he said, Et viser la tête en situation de stress, c'est pas évident. Hein? Yeah. And aiming for the head under high pressure is like very difficult. Yeah. Center mass, right? Would they That's right. Yeah. That's you know right. The thing is, I want to ask, like, I pray, sometimes I believe like I look at threat opportunity and sometimes you got to deal with the threat before you create opportunity. Um, That's right. You know, if a guy's rushing you and I, you know, I've worked a couple, I, I'm not a gun guy, but I worked a couple of them um, and I, you know, yeah, I closed the distance on them and just like much like Robert's experience, but because they didn't deal with the threat first, like they're trying to draw and all this. And meanwhile, That's when you get sad, right? So yeah. I, when I teach knife, I do the same thing because there's a lot of martial arts of a Filipino martial arts instructor that teach like almost like knife dueling. But I always take the training as if uh, you shouldn't try to get out your knife while you're being attacked by someone with a knife. Deal with that before you go for your knife because yeah. that's when you'll get stabbed. Agreed. Yeah, you got to deal with that threat first. Yeah, that's um, wow, fascinating. I don't know what if what you had, you know, what you If there, you've had any questions you want to I, I'm, I'm just going to ask him for a real life experience. Est-ce qu'il uh, y a des incidents avec des couteaux où toi tu es intervenu ou tu as vu des collègues, il y a des exemples que, que tu peux donner que ça a fonctionné ou que ça n'a pas fonctionné? Je suis un, la, la plus grosse intervention que j'ai faite, c'était sur une prise d'otage. Il a resté en 92, je crois où le type, il retenait euh, sa femme, c'était un grand black qui retenait sa femme avec un feuillet de boucher. Je ne sais pas si tu vois un feuillet de boucher, c'est un truc. Oui, 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 oui. Euh, nous, on dit un meat cleaver. Meat cleaver. Yeah. Alors, il retenait une femme, il avait ça dans la main droite et il avait un, un, ciseau, à, un ciseau à bois dans la gorge de la femme. Et moi, je suis arrivé en retard parce que j'habite très loin et quand je suis arrivé, 
le, le, le patron il m'a dit euh, « Patu, viens, c'est un, un truc pour toi. Voilà. » Donc, je, je me suis rapproché, euh, je suis passé entre les patrons un peu, et je me rendais compte que de temps en temps, il baissait le, le bras parce que c'était lourd. Donc, je suis intervenu à un moment où il voulait baisser le bras. J'ai sauté sur la main. Je n'ai pas fait un truc époustouflant. Et, et pas, techniquement, ce n'était pas compliqué. J'ai mis un coup d'épaule parce que le ciseau n'était était plus sur la gorge. J'ai mis un coup d'épaule à la femme qui est partie. Et après, lui, il a voulu absolument se dégager. Donc, je, moi, je tenais sa, sa main haute parce que je ne voulais pas qu'il mette un coup de ciseau à bois. Et puis après, il y a le, la, le groupe d'intervention qui est rentré à la suite de ça. On est parti par terre avec lui. Et, voilà. et j'ai reçu un coup de tonfa sur la tête. Je ne saurais, saurais jamais qui m'a fait ça. OK, this starts out pretty terrible. He says that uh, he went to a hostage intervention at one point and there was a huge man that was holding scissors to a woman's neck and he had a huge meat cleaver in the other hand. Ooh. And uh, Robert got there a little bit late because he lived uh, farther than the others. And when, when he got there, his boss has told him, Robert, this one's for you. You know, it's got, it's, uh, it's knives. So by this time, he said he was monitoring to see the hand would move or whatever. And he said at one point uh, that when, when he had the, the scissors off of the lady's neck, Robert rushed him and grabbed his uh, meat cleaver holding hand. And he was fighting with his arm and they were moving around so he wouldn't stick him with the other thing. And then the rest of the team jumped on the guy to, to get control of him. And he said it was during that time that he received a hard taunt for a smash on his head. And he never found out who it was. When I was at the reunion, I was in the office of the director in trying to talk. Et y a, on, a, on entend une alerte, il y a des gars du GIPN, les gars de mon groupe, qui s'étaient euh, qui qui, qui battus avec un, un gars avec un, qui avait un, un grand clou. Il avait mis un, des, des coups de, avec un grand clou. Ils étaient partis euh, les mains dans les poches, euh, donc évidemment. Et euh, la police avait poursuivi le gars, il était rentré dans la boucherie, il avait pris tous les couteaux et il attendait dans la boucherie. Et moi, je suis arrivé avec ton fa en me disant, bon, bah, ce coup-ci, je vais peut-être être obligé de me servir de ton fa. Quoi. Tout le monde était, était terrorisé. Finalement, il s'est rendu euh, euh, à la négociation. Quoi. Voilà, il s'est oh, okay, okay. apaisé. Il faut savoir que 80% des affaires chez nous, on les, on les règle par la négociation. Quand même, hein. Oui, c'est bien ça. OK, so Robert says that he was uh, on Ile de la Réunion, like a former French colony at one point, and... There was a big commotion outside, and it was like a local who was attacking people with a huge uh, nail. And he said that eventually the guy ran into a butcher shop, and he took all, over all the knives, and he was waiting for them. So Robert went there and negotiated with him, and he eventually just surrendered. And Robert is also a trained negotiator and, and instructor of negotiation techniques. Oh, wow. And it's also part of his uh, system, the Box de Rue, as a negotiation component and he says that in most cases like that 80 percent of the time everything gets resolved through negotiation that's awesome how is he um how did he i guess my question for that um because this is the first time that aspect has ever been brought up in interviews here how did he get um access to that and you know and you know how do you get you know obviously really good at it where he could implement it and reduce to you know like around 80 percent you know c'est dean veut savoir ça provient d'où euh, la formation à négociation c'est qui qui a apporté ça c'est les américains à travers le ré... pardon c'est les... en fait au départ au départ moi les premiers les premières négociations que j'ai vues c'était le, le commissaire broussard qui, qui négociait euh, mais sans aucune formation, lui, il, a, il, a, il avait euh, il négocié comme ça à la, à la bonne franquette, quoi. Voilà. Okay. On s'est dit euh, quand même, euh, bon, ce serait bien que... Donc, il y a un, y a un gars de chez nous qui est parti à Quantico, euh, euh, aux États-Unis, oui. à l'école du, du FBI, il qui a fait des cours de, de négociation, il a ramené ça après. Moi, je me suis toujours intéressé, quand je travaillais en discothèque, moi, en faisant 1m72 et 72 kg, euh, si je ne savais pas négocier, ce n'était pas... Euh, voilà. Donc, j'ai toujours euh, réussi à éviter les gros problèmes quand même. Oui. Quelquefois, j'étais obligé de, de passer à l'acte, mais 
Mais en règle générale, euh, et pourtant, c'était un quartier difficile, c'était le quartier chaud de Paris. Ouais. Euh, bah, J'arrivais toujours à, à ranger les choses. Quoi. Ah, c'est très bien. OK. Uh, so, the first thing uh, Robert says that his first exposure to that, there was a commissaire, which is like, a, you know, a... Broussard. Uh, Broussard. Broussard. But uh, I'm just trying to translate commissaire, traduire commissaire. Uh, so, anyways, it's like a police commissioner, but it, you uh -huh. know, not like in Batman, it's a lower level. Uh, <laughs> way, I think, you know, because I always think of Commissioner Gordon. Uh, oh, but. Sorry. He's saying that uh, this commissaire Broussard would actually just show up and negotiate with people just through personal uh, skill. And eventually, when it, they saw it worked, uh, they decided to send someone from the team to Quantico to train with the FBI. They got better at it, brought it back, and obviously they worked at it. But Robert says that he was always uh, interested in this because, as he said earlier, he was a bouncer for three years. Mm. And he says that. Five six and 150 pounds. You better be good at negotiation. You better be good at talking. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, I'm very interested in negotiation. Yeah. And and I'm interested in negotiators because my profile les interested. Sometimes they had need a warrior, in quotes. When they had to deal with old military militaires, old guys who had who had who had bourlinged. Ils avaient besoin d'un quelqu'un qui soit un peu plus âgé, avec la tête, euh, voilà. Et puis, euh, quelquefois, les gars qui... Moi, j'ai fait, euh, fait ça, j'ai fait ça. Ben, je dis, ouais, moi aussi, tu vois, regarde, regarde mon nez, euh, voilà. <rire> Et donc, mon profil les intéressait. Et puis moi, je me suis toujours intéressé à la négociation aussi. Uh, très intéressant. So, he said that he was always interested in negotiation. And negotiators would also be interested in him because he had a very interesting profile right not a lot of professional fighters become negotiators those guys usually like to hit i was gonna say yeah right it's not, yeah that's it so yeah no it's very good no no that's that's fascinating again I, uh, that's an aspect that's never been discussed on here like i mean negotiation from uh, that perspective well one thing that's popular now in self-defense circles with the better instructors it's a de-escalation de-escalation right so no, negotiation no. in that context also yeah so yeah it's uh, it's very good yeah especially for the, uh, the law law enforcement so is he i know he runs raid so it sounds like he's obviously affiliated with police force or is he well he's he's retired now uh But yeah, he still he still comes in uh, for teaching seminars and everything to wow. the police. And uh, well, Robert has trained police forces all over the world. And as I mentioned yesterday, the reason he was in the Philippines in the first place was to go and teach their police force over there. And uh, they were all amazed by what he was showing, and he was telling them, "Well, actually, it's all Filipino. It comes from here. exactly it's from your it's from your stuff, <laughs> which is sad. But if you look at it back yeah. in time, but now there's a renaissance, right? I find that you know, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Back in that time, I think basketball and taekwondo were like the leading. Um, still, but I, still, I'm so glad there's such a reinsurgence in their own art. I mean, thank God, right? You know, that's it. Robert, euh, je réitérerai le point que tu avais fait hier, euh, que quand tu enseignais à la police aux Philippines, euh, ils étaient impressionnés par la méthodologie, puis tu leur disais, mais ça vient de chez vous. Ça oui. fait un cercle complet, parce que j'étais en train de dire que tu as enseigné à des forces policières partout à travers la planète. Oui, oui. J'ai fait le Brésil, j'ai fait euh, les, les îles, j'ai fait euh, euh, le Salvador, euh, Jamaïque. Euh, euh, République dominicaine, euh, enfin, euh, des pays d'Afrique. Tous les, les pays avec euh, de la belle température. Oui, oui, oui. Des ouais. pays très, très chauds. Oui, très, très chauds. So, Robert has taught uh, police forces all over the world, as I was saying, and he mentioned Brazil, El Salvador, Dominican Republic, and uh, many countries across Africa. Wow, El Salvador. I mean, those are not, yeah, cheers. No, 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 those are not delicate places. That's what I mean, man. You're not talking about, like, you know, your, yeah, that's, oof. yeah. Et quand je, quand je suis allé en Chine aussi pour, pour un stage de boxe de rue à l'Institut des Arts Martiaux Chinois, je, le, je leur faisais travailler des, 
pas que ça haut, par exemple, des, des choses, mais je les faisais, comme je le faisais vite et que je ne le faisais pas d'une façon martiale. Ils ne reconnaissaient pas. Ils ne reconnaissaient pas. Ils disaient, mais ça, c'est vachement bien. Ça me dit, mais ça vient de chez vous aussi. Ça. <rire> so après, said, je l'ai adapté, a... adapté autrement, mais ça, ça vient de chez vous. Quoi. Ça. Uh, il said that he went to train, to teach actually at the Chinese Martial Arts Institute. Dans, dans quelle ville en Chine, Robert, tu sais? Comment? Tu étais dans quelle ville en Chine avec cet institut? À, à Pékin, à, à l'Institut des Arts Martiaux Chinois à Pékin. OK, à Pékin. So, he was in Beijing at the, at the Chinese Martial Arts Institute, which is a, a pretty big deal. And as he mentioned earlier, he had this experience from the Innocento Academy. So, one of the things he was teaching was his modified version of Chi Sao. And everybody was remarking on how great it was and how great mm -hmm. it worked. And same thing, he said... This is, uh, this is from here. It's the yeah. same thing. La, quand la femme m'a appelé au départ, mm -hmm. il y a une femme, une chinoise qui m'a appelé parce qu'elle parlait français. Elle m'a appelé, bonjour monsieur, est-ce que vous voudriez venir faire un stage de self-défense en Chine Alors moi, j'explose de rire parce que je me dis, c'est un copain, un ancien copain ah. qui me fait une connerie, quoi, une blague. <rire> J'ai dit, ouais, ouais, c'est ça, sûrement qu'en Chine, ils ont besoin d'un professeur dans, pour les sports de combat. Et alors, elle me rappelle après, elle me dit, je crois que vous ne me prenez pas au sérieux. Ben non, pas du tout. Euh, elle m'a envoyé, à, à envoyé à, elle m'a demandé mon adresse mail et puis elle m'a envoyé euh, un truc. Il a dit, oh là là. C'était formel. OK, so, c'était vrai. The way, the way Robert got invited to, to go teach in China, he said, a Chinese woman who spoke French actually called him on his phone and he laughed at her because he, he thought somebody was pulling his leg. And then she called him back and she says, I have a feeling you're not taking me seriously. He said, no, not at all. So yeah. she asked for, for his email and then sent something very uh, formal. Formal, yeah. Which, and yeah. he was like, oh, okay, this is for real. So, oh my gosh, he almost flew like a, a really good yeah. gig. You know? <laughs> a really good opportunity there. <laughs> wow. Um, I don't know. But, if one thing I just want to mention, uh, I, went to, I went to train uh, with... Uh, with Robert at one of his seminars in France. And I don't know how big your seminars here are, Dean, but uh, if I get 30 people at a seminar, and I don't mean for me, I mean for big names that I bring in. If I bring in 30 people, I'm very excited. Same here, it's and the same here, that's good. See, that's yeah. it, but I had gone, this was very cool, that's how I met Robert. I went to see him, so he drove me to the south of France and we did a seminar together with uh, Joel Lawson and one of his top students and a good friend of mine. And while we were there, the organizer came to see Robert to apologize because I think he said he only had like 80 or 100 students, like I'm really sorry. Exactly, so I was like, what? what? And usually seminars could go up to 200 people, it was insane. That's awesome uh, here, like you said, man, if you get 30, that's, that's like yeah, pretty but good. But in France, There's a huge martial arts culture. J'étais juste en train de, de parler la fois que j'étais allé à Juvignac avec toi. Euh, oui. Ton ami à l'époque, euh, il disait, non, l'organisateur, j'oublie son ah, nom, puis Jean-Loup, il s'excusait qu'il n'y avait pas plus de gens. Puis pour moi, c'était un des plus gros stages auxquels j'avais participé. Dean dit la même chose euh, aux États-Unis, au Canada, des groupes comme toi, tu as. C'est du jamais vu. Oui. Oui, c'est... It's pretty impressive for in terms of numbers because I've oh never seen God. that. Oh, see, right. like you said, there's a strong culture there. I mean, that's... Yeah, you that's know. it. Absolutely. Wow, wow, yeah. wow, wow. Um, exactly. I have one thing. Um, it just, hun, is why he advocates, and I'm sure it's based on his experience and all that, but which I'm much in agreement with, the whole thing... Like, I equate, when I train my people, like, take the biological response... And like, and then turn into, you know, which would be generally speaking, gross motor movements, and then impart your skill set, whatever that may be. Um, it, how does he, how does he feel on that? It sounds like he's, that's kind of what he does. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, right? that's it. Uh, Dean veut savoir, puis j'ai dit oui. Uh, quand tu enseignes ou quand tu développes une méthodologie, tu tiens compte des réactions physiologiques comme l'adrénaline et ce genre de choses-là. Bien sûr, bien sûr. Au niveau de la mobilité et puis de la fine motricité, on ne peut ouais. pas avoir rien de trop complexe, c'est ça? Bien sûr. C'est pour ça que 
mettre un coup de pied, un coup de pied dans la tête à quelqu'un quand il y a du verre de là par terre, c'est pas une bonne idée, par exemple. Et quand on a un grand manteau, en plus, voilà. Absolument. And ouais. so, Dean, what he's saying is like it's not just the physiological aspect; it's the environmental too. Uh, if you're trying to fight a huge jacket, you can't you can't do everything you'd like, and you, you're going to get grabbed too. But also, you don't try head kicks when you're when you're on yeah, ice. Not this guy. The environment, plus. Il y a des choses intéressantes aussi. C'est on, on, dans tous les arts martiaux, on travaille beaucoup le coup de pied génital, par exemple. Or, le coup de pied génital, on joue sur la douleur. Sur quelqu'un qui est chargé d'adrénaline ou chargé d'alcool et voir les deux, il va pouvoir supporter la douleur. Il ne va pas tomber comme ça, euh, forcément. C'est pour ça que je travaille plus sur le plexus ou le foie, par exemple, parce que là, c'est le, le corps qui, qui dit stop, le corps s'arrête. On peut pas, euh, quand tu vois sur un combat de boxe, quand on est touché au foie ou au plexus, le gars, il met le genou par terre, quoi, parce que il a beau avoir la, la, la volonté d'en faire, euh, le corps dit euh, stop. Ouais, ça, Très bien. So, what, to get back to what you just said, Don, uh, Dean, I, I think this is a really cool answer. He says a lot of techniques are pain compliance based. And he said even the, the kick to the groin where everybody thinks it's the fight ender. Like if you're on adrenaline or you're drunk mm -hmm. or both, you can sustain that shot and keep moving, right? Yeah. So he says that most of the material that he teaches focuses on striking the solar plexus or the liver, you know, the good old liver shot, because uh, while you can resist a kick in the groin and, and tolerate and keep moving, not so with a liver shot or the plexus, because then it's an involuntary response, mm -hmm. your body shuts down. So it, he advocates that a lot more than trying to strike the groin. That's great. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, especially what I mean on what you just mentioned there, like you, you know the liver. I mean, like you know solar plexus. But that's the first time I've heard like somebody advocating other than pure boxing, of course. Yeah. You know, which yeah. would make sense, you know, due to his. Um, well, don't forget his system is as boxing. It's street boxing, right? Yeah. So there's a heavy reliance on the hands and the same targeting as the boxing. Yeah, makes maybe sense. Less, maybe less targeting of the head. Yeah. But that's it. Wow, wow. I mean, that's, uh, um, I only had a few more, like, but like, what's his, um, so what is he doing now? What's his, like, what does he continue to do? Is he still doing seminars? Is yeah. He oh, yeah. Listen, uh, before, before I ask him, I'll just give you a little bit of uh, background. Uh, Robert has been involved in movies as consultant and stuntman wow. for a long time. Robert, ça fait combien d'années que, que tu travailles au niveau des films en tant que conseiller, cascadeur, chorégraphe? Tu as commencé quand? Oh, la, pre la première fois, je crois que c'était en euh, 97 ou 98. OK, so starting in 97, he's been mm -hmm. doing a lot of... Oui, c'était sur euh, un film qui s'appelle Virgile. Un film oh, OK. Oui, donc ça serait moins connu aux États-Unis probablement. Oui, oui, oui. So, Robert has been doing, uh, participating in a variety of movies, mostly French movies. But I remember him telling me a story about being in uh, Taken 2. Je voyais sur Taken. C'est ça, c'est ce que j'allais répéter. So he was, uh, he was on Taken 2 with Liam Neeson. And like, as he's mentioned, Robert is 5'6", and he's got a big head of white hair. So, you know, it could be misleading uh, how dangerous he is. So he was fighting Liam Neeson at one point. And Liam Neeson would throw him. And whenever they yell cut, Liam Neeson would run over to him and go, Oh my God, are you okay? I oh, thought you know what? I love funny. those Taken series. I'm going to have to go back now and yeah, watch uh, Taken I'm, too. I'm not even sure the scene made the cut, though. Pour okay. la scène dans Taken avec uh, Liam Neeson, est-ce que ça s'est rendu au final? Alors, je sais, euh, moi, je sais qu'il y a une, une scène que. Parce qu'au départ, je viens, moi, surtout pour le, comme conseiller pour les armes. Et euh, par exemple, il y a une scène, à un moment, le gars, il, il rentre, euh, Liam Nesson, il rentre, euh, il se bat avec les gars, bah, 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 son arme est vide, il prend une arme sur la table et il part. Et là, et là je lui dis, euh, non, non, si tu prends une arme sur la table, tu ne tu sais pas ce, comment elle est. Donc, tu, tu vérifies qu'il qu y a un chargeur, tu vérifies qu'il y a une cartouche. Euh, voilà, euh, voilà c'était des trucs comme ça, surtout. 
Et puis finalement, ils me font, ils me font jouer euh, un peu une figuration à un moment. Donc, je suis habillé comme un musulman avec un petit bonnet. Oui, oui. Réparé un, un, un machin, là, une pipe à... Non, ok, chicha. Voilà. Et puis, je l'attaque avec un extincteur. Quoi. Et donc, il esquive. Et puis là, il me met un coup avec le, le, le pistolet qui est, qui, est, qui est vide, avec la culasse à l'arrière. Oui. Et donc, il, il ramène la, la culasse vers l'avant et il m'arrache la gorge. Quoi, voilà. oh. Alors, il paraît qu'il euh, y a des... Ça a été coupé, ça. Là. Ça a été coupé. C'était ce, ce, un peu gore, ça a été coupé. <rire> Mais c'est euh, Liam Nesson, c'est un, un garçon très correct, très poli. Euh, il n'arrêtait pas de me dire ça va, euh, ça va, c'est euh, ok, c'est ok. Oui, 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 oui. Yeah. So he's ça. saying that, that Liam Neeson had a lot of concern for him, and so initially Robert was there as a, as a weapons consultant. Okay. You know, like oh, if the guns, and if you're picking up some some gun that somebody dropped, you have to check it, doing all that stuff, and making sure that there was realism. And in there, like at one point, they're like, "Well, we're running out of stuntmen," so they put him in a in a little costume, and uh, he went to attack him. He said, and then, uh, what's his name, uh, Liam Neeson, just smashed him with the gun, but the, it was racked and it was empty, right? But when he hit him. The slide went back and cut his throat out. It was really gory. So they ended up cutting the scene. But he said that Liam Neeson is one of the nicest people that he's met, just based on his concern for him and the politeness throughout the whole process. A very nice person. I could see. Yeah, I've heard that. Wow. That's wow. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and watch. <laughs> but the other thing on top of movies, Uh, Robert has written eight books so far. Eight uh, books. Eight books, oh. and they're all awesome. Uh, like, he's got the two main um, uh, books de rue books, which are, like I said, compendium of technique. It's mm -hmm. actually the curriculum for his approach. Book one is empty hands. Book two is dealing with weapons. Okay. And like, I have a lot of uh, English-speaking students that don't read a word of French, and I still got them to get the book. And they all agree that it's one of the best books they've ever seen because of the pictures and everything. Okay. Okay. You, you don't yeah. need to, to read French to get everything. Yeah. Unfortunately, you'll be missing a lot of the psychological and, and re uh, physiological response discussion, negotiation, because there's a lot of extra material in there. And Robert and I were also discussing maybe translating the two books in English and then putting them out on the market who knows why amazon or something but yeah. still that's that's i mean eight books well, other than that you wrote one on strategy and the other one is like the the combative spirit il y a un copain qui a envoyé un message là martial qui a oublié le film avec les charles oh, <laughs> sérieux charles ouais, attendez, oh boy okay so Robert did a movie with it's not going to mean anything to people in in america but quand je, quand je tourne, les gens me disent toujours « Venez, euh, remplissez une fiche, vous nous intéressez, vous avez un profil qui nous intéresse et tout ça. » Mais c'est pour faire de la, de la, de la figuration. Et, oui, oui, oui. et moi, ça m'embête de prendre le boulot aux gens qui n'attendent oui. pas. Quoi. Donc, je viens quand c'est pour la police ou quand c'est pour la boxe. Voilà. Okay. Parce que dans mon domaine, pour être conseillé dans mon domaine, je viens. Mais autrement, si c'est pour faire juste blablabla, ça m'intéresse. Oui, c'est ça. Okay, so he, he says, you know, he gets a lot of offers to be on screen as a, mm. what do you call that, a figurant. You know, the people in the background and all that stuff. Yeah. And okay. he says, he, that's not what he usually he does. He just goes whenever it's for weapons or martial arts, and sometimes they'll put him in the movie just because he's on the spot. But, yeah, he's not, uh, he's not looking that's, for that. But he was bad. mentioning having, well, actually one of his friends, uh, Martial, was mentioning the fact that he was in a movie with a comedic team so that would have been les charlots were very popular in the french speaking world in the 70s and 80s and i grew up watching those guys so i didn't know that oh Pretty wow cool. how interesting wow wow so what's yeah. um so what's where what is his future goals i mean what you know what does he well, want to further just, accomplish or well know? listen on top of the books the martial arts book he wrote two novels Uh, he also, he's got a lot of DVDs out there and uh, 
I've got a I've got a page called Books de Rue Canada, and I put a lot of material on there for anybody who's interested. Okay. Uh, and it's it's pretty great actually. He's got uh, Robert. T'as fait combien de de vidéos DVD à peu près? Uh, Sept ou huit. Sept ou huit. So he's got something like eight DVDs out on a variety of different yeah. topics for his system. Sept livres. Sept livres. Okay. Entre les romans et les... Oui, oui, avec tout ça. Ah non, je pensais que c'était huit. Oui, ça peut être huit, je ne sais plus. Ça, yeah. Je pense que c'est sept, ça va bien. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, and a funny thing that we haven't touched on, but reflects Robert's logo, is uh, his nickname is the Gorilla, because, uh, first of all, he's built like one, he's got the long arms. And Est-ce que, est que tu as vu avec mon éditeur? Pour... Je n'ai pas eu la chance de le contacter encore, mais ça sent bien, ça. But, uh, but Robert, that's it. His nickname is the Gorilla. And uh, it's also reference to a, to a famous uh, French film from, from, I think, the 50s. But in most of his seminars, he like imitates a gorilla and he does a really good job too. <laughs> but that's also why his logo is a gorilla. Je suis en train de leur expliquer que ton, uh, okay. ton, uh, ton petit nom, c'est le gorille uh, en France. Tout à fait. Yeah. So hence the logo then on his on this uh, logo symbol. Okay, the yeah, picture. That's, right. that's him. Technically, that's him. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. Puis alors, Robert, c'est quoi tes buts futurs? Tu continues à enseigner des stages et, et quoi ah, d'autre? Diminuer les stages. Ensuite, okay. à la maladie. So, diminuer les stages et puis bon, euh, je, je, enfin, j'en fais moins. J'en fais moins. Ouais. Actuellement, j'en fais deux par mois, j'en fais quatre par mois. Ouais. Et, et je suis euh, souvent contacté pour la négociation, par contre. Ah, oh, OK, ça, c'est bien. Okay. J'ai fait une formation pour 400 notaires euh, dans un amphithéâtre. Waouh, ils prennent au sérieux. Et la Banque de France qui m'a contacté aussi. Oh. Qui est intéressée par ce que je fais. Et non pas par la, l'aspect self-défense, mais sur l'aspect euh, négociation. Négociation, OK. Ouais. So, Robert was saying that he, 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 he slacked off on the seminar scene. He used to do two a month. For a month, now it's two a month. So basically every weekend up to like the beginning of the pandemic, now he's cut down to two a month. And he said he's actually fielding almost as many calls for negotiation training as for martial arts. And he was saying that he just gave a seminar to 400 notaries on uh, negotiation techniques. Wow. Does he yeah, know? Robert uh, has developed a multitude of expertise. No kidding. Does he ever, um, does he frequent the U.S. or, or seldom? Not, not anymore. Uh, I don't think he did since uh, a long time. Robert, est-ce que tu reviens aux États-Unis des fois? Je ne suis pas tourné depuis, non, non. Je, je... Non. Non, non. Canada? I mean, you guys? Or... Canada, I've brought him to Canada. Là, oui, j'ai parlé beaucoup. Une de... fois ou deux fois? Une fois. On a, on a bien aimé ça. Moi, je suis allé, euh, je suis allé la première fois en 60, euh, 78, je crois, à l'école, à l'école de police de Nicolette. Okay. So, his first time in, in Canada was 1978 to, uh, to the Quebec Provincial uh, Police School. Okay. And then uh, and the second time was when I brought him over, and now it's been a few years, I think 2017, 2018. Les moniteurs. L'école de police. C'est les moniteurs de l'école de police qui avaient demandé à un gars de la boxe française. Ils voulaient. Euh, à... oh, c'est comme ça qu'il t'avait. OK. So, what, the, the reason he ended up in Quebec, well, first of all, everybody speaks French, so that, that's an easy mm. thing right there. But it's because the, the police trainers at the academy asked a Savat fighter who they could bring in that could teach the police and do an exceptional job. And, that person immediately mentioned uh, Robert. Okay. Wow. 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 It's going back 78. That's just wow. I mean, <clears throat> like you said, I mean, just multifaceted, talented. I mean, this, I mean, wow. I mean, like you, you know, mentioned. One thing I'll tell you Robert has an incredible sense of humor. And even if he tried to tell jokes right now, I wouldn't translate them because we'd all be canceled. <laughs> yeah, he's got a hell of a sense of humor. Uh, oh my God! FMA discussion is no yeah. longer. <laughs> That's right. It's been discontinued. Uh, Eric Lolanga told me a story one time that Robert did bring. Uh, well, I don't know if it was Robert, but Danny Nosanto went to France 
and he was sitting with Robert, but Robert doesn't speak English and Dan doesn't speak, uh, mm. doesn't speak French. So there was somebody in the middle translating jokes. And from what I understand, Dan Inosanto couldn't catch his breath the whole night. And I've experienced it too. Uh, oh my gosh. Very funny man. Bonjour Eric d'ailleurs, parce que oui. est avec nous. So, oui, puis euh, j'étais juste en train de lui dire comment tu rigolais beaucoup avec, avec Dan quand il est allé en France. Oui, oui, oui. Puis une autre chose, uh, I, I'm also a student of uh, Guru Dan, and at one point I was, in, uh, I was at Philippe Janina School for a seminar, and I went to, to ask him, I said, you, do you remember Robert Paturel? And of course, when I said it with a French accent, he, he had no idea who it was. But then I said, Robert Patrell. Like, oh, yeah. He's like, that's one of my favorite people ever. So I've oh, never wow. seen him. He's very nice, but I never he heard him say that about another person. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. He yeah. definitely resonated with him. Or oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's it. Right. Wow. So <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know if you have anything else. I, um, I went through I all think, my... I think we covered pretty much everything I had yeah. taken, taken down a couple notes here. Mm. Robert, je pense que j'ai tout couvert, Dean aussi, puis est-ce qu'il y a des choses, euh, tu as un mot pour fermer? Ou... Ben, écoute, non, j'étais très heureux de, de converser avec vous et, et puis euh, j'espère que j'ai bien répondu à toutes vos questions et puis ouais, mm. tout va bien pour moi. Super. So, he, he's just saying that uh, we can finish here and he wanted to thank you for inviting, you, inviting us. I got and, uh, yeah, and yeah. he said it was a, a great pleasure and he enjoyed it very much. Salut à tous mes frères canadiens. Et... Yeah, yeah, I don't know. And a big thank you to you, of course. For... Merci à Dan. Merci. My pleasure. Yeah. You know, like, like I was telling you the first time I was on your show is uh, Robert is the type of person that people would gain a lot from knowing him. Oh my God, I get, I'm, I'm hearing it. Yeah, I'm hearing it. And I'm bringing him back to Montreal next year or, or Ottawa. But oh, please. Uh, oh, 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 please let me in know. In Eastern Canada, and I will let you know. And I'll, yeah. And I'll abuse your uh, page with all kinds of posts. Oh, no, no. That, that goes without saying. Yeah. I mean, put his jokes on there, put everything on there. You know what I mean? FMA, FMA discussion gone wild. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, definitely. thank you very much, Dean. Uh, You know, we all we both enjoyed it very much. Yeah, I appreciate you both. Thank you, thank you so much. But uh, you know, please, you know, tell him thank you and you know to take care of himself and all that. Ciao. Il te, il te remercie puis uh, il souhaite tout ce qu'il y a de mieux. Ouais. Merci. Merci beaucoup. All right, guys. Thank you, Dean. Bye right. <clears throat> bye. All right. Take care. <laughs> uh, oh, I don't know what I just did there. There we go. Almost <laughs> mine. Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, that wraps up 311. Wow, that guy is incredible. I can see why they reference him as a Dan Asano in Europe. Um, next, tomorrow, <clears throat> doubleheader weekend, Steve Grody, he is going to be covering his cognitive life. It's all going to be just live videos, no bio. So he's basically going to be showcasing what his system's about. So that's going to be 3 p.m. Eastern time. So if you want to see what Steve uh, Grody does you know, for free, basically, <laughs> that's a good chance to uh, check that out again tomorrow, 3 o'clock. And uh, what else? What else? Raffle. Uh, end of the month for uh, Jesse's stolen equipment. Ten bucks a ticket. You know, it's pinned on the uh, FMA discussion. And I think that's about it. But I want to thank everybody that joined in, commented, and we'll see you, some of you, tomorrow. Take care.